Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Wednesday, May 12th, and we are going to be continuing our consideration of S7, a bill pertaining to the sealing and expungement of criminal records. For those who are watching on YouTube on our committee page, you can find the documents that we will be discussing today in terms of S7, it is draft 2.3. And then after our discussion on S7, uh, we will be moving to budget proposals and then moving back to um, S7 later in the day. Uh, so with that, I would like to welcome Attorney Jay Johnson. Good morning. Oops. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to join the committee again. Um, I thank you for the draft. I received it yesterday and I was able to review it last night. Um, I guess I was thinking maybe it would be more helpful if the committee started with questions because I, I got the feeling last time that maybe not everyone understood or took in what I was saying in my testimony. Well, I, I think in terms of, well, thank you. I think in terms of moving forward, um, it would be helpful for, for us to understand if this current draft addressed your concerns that were in your, in your testimony, as well as your written proposal. And, and really, um, I focused um, more on your written proposal and, and what you're asking for in there. So, so my question is, does this, does this address it? Thank you. Um, well, so you're asking me, does this address it? And um, I guess what I could say is that I appreciate the fact that you have taken many of my comments. Um, I do, I would like to say that um, I think what I have learned, especially from the redraft, um, is I think from listening to testimony um, from Commissioner Sherling, actually, regarding the need for a more rational system um, of sealing and expungement. Um, sort of, I think this exercise of picking and choosing among misdemeanor offenses <clears throat> demonstrates that. Um, so I think his point, which I take, is that it could be less difficult to decide what crimes if they can be accessed for certain limited purposes. Um, so I guess that's the first takeaway for me from this process. Um, Actually, second excuse, is, me. excuse me, I'm sorry, yeah. um, just clarification. When you say um, access for limited purposes, um, so we haven't heard from the commissioner yet. He's gonna hop right. on um, later. So can you help me understand what you mean by access for limited purposes? Uh, well, so you're asking what I mean um, by access for limited purposes. And I would say that is in the law now regarding sealing. Um, I guess I, I, it would maybe be worth further investigating or exploring the idea of um, if you were to seek to expunge more crimes, um, you know, or say for example, even the felony property crimes now, uh, maybe taking testimony from employers, figuring out what is important to employers so that employers feel comfortable hiring Vermonters, um, particularly in the world of remote work where more Vermonters may have access to work outside the state while remaining in Vermont. Um, it just may be something worth exploring is, is all I'm saying. But, but we do have a system of sealing now in part, and that does um, provide for limited access for certain purposes. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I realized I cut you off. So <laughs> go ahead. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so I think, again, I would like to reiterate that we should be focused on certain principles. And um, again, I'd like to say that that's length of time needed to reduce risk of reoffense, no intervening crimes, and court involvement and discretion. I think that the changes made go part of the way there, but I think what they also do is expand the discretion of state's attorneys to delegate their authority to, um, to make that, to, to, to essentially um, 
stipulate to the reduced period for certain crimes. Um, and I, I do not believe that that is consistent with the original intent, which was to give state's attorneys um, the, the leeway that they needed in order to um, make determinations case by case because they know the people in their communities. They understand the record of the offenders. Um, they know the interaction of the offenders with the justice system. That was my impression was that this was limited, while we don't favor it, this was limited to state's attorneys. And then this became expanded to, I'm assuming, well, other state's attorneys or the AG. Um, and, and what I understand, and, and again, I don't know this to be true, but from what I understand from others is that in the course of conducting um, expungement clinics, this the, the, the various prosecutors seek to obtain blanket waivers for certain crimes so that numbers of people can be, have their records expunged early for certain crimes. And I would say that this is the policy issue that we're discussing right now. And we're delegating that to the state's attorneys and the attorney general. That may be the intent, um, but I think that that is a decision for the legislature and the executive branch. Um, so I think specifically to reiterate our concerns, and again, I'm assuming you're getting more testimony from DOC and um, public safety and possibly state's attorneys. Um, DOC testimony, I believe has been to access has been access to affidavits and um, that is necessary to determine criminal behaviors. Um, and that is, is part of the theory behind our criminal, um, our justice reinvestment work, which is seeking to connect offenders to more appropriate levels of service. Um, that access in the changes made is, is fairly limited. Um, and I think that the whole point was to provide better services, connect our, um, our offender population with appropriate services and without a record of criminogenic behaviors um, that, is less, um, that is less useful to DOC. And I think that they even maybe proposed a pilot project to see, um, but I don't believe that that was incorporated. Um, and, Finally, I, I'm not. I'm not familiar with the with the pilot with the pilot project. So, oh, I'm sorry. Well, that's not for me to propose. I guess that was something I understood that DOC was willing to consider if you were um, going to to essentially allow them to access um, offender records. Um, but again, DOC can speak to that directly. Uh, but I, so I just would like to reiterate, we have consistently expressed that concern. And I think that ex that concern has been addressed to a very limited extent. And I would just question the usefulness of that. Um, finally, oh, not finally. Anyway, my understanding was that there would be no stipulation for felony property offenses. I don't recall seeing that in the most recent draft. Um, I believe what gave DFR comfort and DFR may be on the call, I'm not sure is that there was an eight year period required with no intervening crimes before sealing. So um, I would, again, I think at least want to say, see no stipulation for felony property offenses. Um, finally, I think what, what we didn't touch on last time was our repeated requests for a fiscal note. Uh, I don't know that we have some idea, I believe what this will cost the judiciary, but um, I think the AG in its letter um, to the committee noted that this seemed like a reasonable request um, and we don't know what the aggregate costs are um, that you're going to be looking for funding for for the next fiscal year. Yeah, thank you. I actually um, was in contact with JFO yesterday and they are um, they are they have begun um, a fiscal note based on this latest draft. Okay. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. That's it for me. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing any questions from the committee. Um, Selena. I apologize if this question is, is redundant with any of your testimony. I had a little technical difficulties jumping on to Zoom this morning, but 
I'm just trying, it sounded like in the testimony that I did hear um, the administration has concerns about the current draft. I'm, I'm trying to understand what, does the administration support the current draft or, or not? Uh, good morning, Representative. Um, good morning. You're asking, do we support the current draft or not? And I express my concerns with the current draft. So is that, is that a no then? That is, we have concerns with the current draft. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Kate, and then Bob. Thanks, good morning. Um, so I, I guess part of what I'm hearing you say is that there is um, understandably attention being paid to what the administrative impact of this kind of policy will have in terms of how challenging it is to, to roll out expungement and, and do the administrative labor. And I, I guess I'm just, like when I think about this policy, the original bill was actually in my mind much more clear about what was expungible and what wasn't expungible. And the current form, and it seems like the direction that we've been heading is, is sort of creating more and more carve outs, which to me seems like it creates more complexity administratively. And so I guess I'm just curious if you can speak to that a little bit more, like if administrative ease is part of your assessment, which, I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand how then the response is to create more carve outs within the expungement bill. Um, so good morning, representative. Uh, so I, I understand that you heard me to say my point was administrative ease. Uh, and I don't believe that was my point. Um, I was not favoring more carves out, carve outs or fewer carve outs. Uh, what I said in the beginning was, I believe that this kind of process actually makes, I think Commissioner Sherling's point regarding the need for a more rational system. And that this would be an easier process if we focused on sealing uh, rather than and, and under what circumstances records could be sealed. And I would defer to Commissioner Sherling to explain more about what he means by that from, but I, I was, I do not believe I was saying that my focus is administrative ease. So when you say rational system, can you, can you describe, like, how are you defining rational? What does that mean exactly? Well, so you're asking me what I mean by rational system, and I am not prepared to answer that question at this time. I think that is the kind of thing that the committees and legislature should be considering. Okay, I'm sorry. So we should consider a rational system, but, but you're not prepared to define what a rational system, what, like what that means in the context of this legislation? I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm genuinely trying to understand what, what, ra like what that actually means so that it can sort of help inform our process here. So you're asking me what I mean by rational system. And again, I would have to say that I'm not prepared to answer that question. I believe it's a conversation that needs to be had. I believe that that's part of what's contemplated in the reporting that's required um, by this particular bill. And um, I think that from what I have learned, I think from Commissioner Sherling's testimony, that question should be asked first before we go picking and choosing a lot of um, crimes to add or <clears throat> to subtract. Okay, thank you. I think one of the themes that came up the last time we um, see that you were here and we took testimony was this sort of idea of objective and subjective Language, I would say that, you know, rational um, is in my mind a subjective word and it can mean many different things. And so I appreciate your efforts to define what that means to you. I'm sorry, is that a question? Okay. Um, nope, that was appreciation, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, 
Bob Cannon and Selena. Hey, Madam, Madam Chair, if I may, I think Commissioner Sherling's here. He might be able to help if we want to jump to him. Um, that um, Bob, is that okay with you? Fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Yes, Commissioner, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see that Zoom is working better than Teams is this morning. So um, I, you and I have been in, in contact in terms of um, email. So I was wondering if you could um, elaborate on, on your concerns. And I think that would help clarify um, where um, Attorney Johnson is, is coming from as, as well and, um, and next steps forward, perhaps. Certainly. Um, from your standpoint, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for having me. And uh, for the record, Mike Sherling, Commissioner of, of Public Safety, um, I was able to listen to about an hour or so of uh, testimony yesterday afternoon, but had to jump off at about 3.30. Um, I very much appreciate uh, the work that went into the more uh, specific feedback that I provided last uh, week uh, around uh, components of uh, the, the bill as drafted. Um, then and I guess uh, in listening just to the last uh, few minutes, um, uh, Attorney Johnson and I have not had a chance to talk about this in any depth uh, since the um, the testimony last week. But uh, I do think we're we're coming at this from generally the same uh, perspective. Um, my cons my primary concern and what I tried to relay last week was sort of two. Uh, two, two areas uh, of concern. One is the overall approach uh, and the potential downsides to um, making uh, fragmented changes that then cascade into unintended uh, consequences. And then the, the second, uh, which I think you've uh, very adequately uh, addressed in the last uh, few days with edits, were examples of potential unintended consequences that were specific to this uh, draft uh, of updates to the expungement statutes. Um, my, my overarching fear is that annual incremental changes to something this complicated without a comprehensive review create additional unintended consequences that we can't anticipate easily until we begin implementing uh, the statute. So without sort of stepping back and looking at the comprehensive system and um, looking at how the, uh, the whole thing works in its entirety together, um, I, I can almost guarantee there will be unintended consequences. And the example I provided to the chair this morning is over the last few weeks, we have bumped into a number of fairly substantive things that are now uh, cascading into uh, operations and um, and there are legal implications around juvenile statutes that have been changed in much the same manner where they're done incrementally without a comprehensive look at the overarching impacts uh, of the systemic changes that are being made. And we've got at least three, what I would term fairly major impacts that are occurring and we haven't even uh, begun to unpack further. So I, I only put that out as a placeholder uh, and an example, a parallel example, we will get back to you with much more detail about what we're encountering uh, in the systems relative to the juvenile changes that have been made. Um, my fear is that the same things uh, happen with other um, complex systems like expungement without a comprehensive review of the totality of impact uh, and the totality of the system itself. So. It, it, it put to oversimplify it, and I don't mean to make this sound pejorative, but tinkering with it versus uh, taking a deep dive into it has uh, there are hazards to that, and that's the primary concern. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. And so, I think what I'm hearing is something like the um, the study that is in the latest draft, but also was, was more expansive in prior drafts. Is, is something that ideally I think you would like to see. Is that is that fair? 
That's true. And I think it's important to note for anyone listening who did, who wasn't privy to my testimony, uh, not the last time, but the, the first time I testified on this bill, um, we very much agree with the majority of the, uh, the policy goals um, with expanding expungement. And I firmly believe there is a better system to achieve those policy goals and looking at comprehensive ceiling um, that not only achieve the policy goals that are stated uh, here and in some of the other iterative approaches to expungement, but also achieve some additional policy goals that um, are uh, really areas of concern that have been voiced through these various processes over the years that could be addressed in a comprehensive um, look at how to do all of this um, rather than the incremental approach that's um, that's being contemplated. Thank you. Um, so just a, as a heads up, I'm gonna need to go to another meeting at 9.30 and um, Representative Burt will take over. Um, Ken, is your, do you have a question or is your hand up from before? Yeah, I, I'll go if I can. Absolutely, and then Selena. So is, is there any possible way to, so there's two things that's going on in my mind. Either we put this on hold for another year. And one of the big reasons why I say that is we're so backed up anyway. Are we really going to accomplish anything with the court systems this year um, with everything that's associated with this? And if we can do something, are there some easy ones that the administration and and the committees will agree to that we could move some forward and then do a lot more next year if that's what everybody wants to do? I think that's directed towards uh, Commissioner Sherwin. Thank you, Ken. Uh, thanks. That That's not a question that I have um, specifically contemplated, so I'm not sure I have uh, I have an answer. So in other words, what, uh, what cross sections of what's being contemplated here would make sense? Uh, again, uh, my initial reaction, and, and don't take this as a comprehensive position, is, um, you know, making incremental changes, even small ones, may have cascading impacts that we can't anticipate without looking at the whole system. Um, I, I guess my, my question, and it's partially rhetorical, maybe there's a, an answer, is why not take a, a hard look at this over the next several months and, and into the next session? Is there something that's going to be accomplished in the next nine months that is so critical that, um, that it needs to be done incrementally? Uh, yeah, that's what I heard you just say, and that's what I kind of just threw back out there just for clarification in my mind, I guess. Um, okay, I'm good for now. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, if I could just jump in. Our letter to the committees originally asked for a delay. Thank you. Uh, Lots of hands up. Um, I think Bob, Selena, and then Barbara. Thank you. Good morning, Attorney Johnson. Thanks for being here. Uh, I was noticing and reading through the bill, there's several different places where uh, the bill uh, takes discretion from presiding judges and then gives it back to the court and other sections by using the word may, shall, so on and so forth. But on page, I don't know if you have the draft in front of you or not, on page 11, more specifically, uh, lines 15 through 19, I'm sure you've read through this. Do you, are you familiar with, is this common language uh, for bills to, to direct uh, uh, judges as to where it says the court shall grant a petition? Without a hearing, without a hearing, is this common language or? Um, good morning, Representative. Um, so you're asking me. I 
I would say that this is a, a question you probably should be asking the courts. Um, this is something that we have noticed uh, that the legislature does direct the courts to um, to make a certain uh, type of ruling or, um, but that that's, yes, there, there is directive language in other statutes with respect to what the courts shall do. So in, in reading 15 through 19, uh, you didn't, you didn't foresee any problems with that? Uh, quite frankly, and, and I guess this would be for uh, the judiciary to testify too, I, I do think it's problematic when discretion of the courts is removed. Okay, thank but, you. Okay. Um, I think, <laughs> sorry, Ken, Selena, and then Barbara, and, and I'll be hopping off soon. I have to put my hand down. I'm all set for now. Thank you. Okay, then um, Selena and Barbara. Thank you. And I guess I'll say belatedly good morning. Um, so, uh, and I'm not sure, I think um, Commissioner Sher Sherling or um, Attorney Councillor Johnson could answer this or both because it speaks to something that both of you said about just process and wanting to take a comprehensive rather than incremental look at expungement, which I do think the legislature and this with the help of the sentencing commission has actually done over the course of a couple of years on the underlying bill. Um, that the administration opposes is, is really the result of that work and an attempt to create a comprehensive rather than incremental system. And the, you know, the more incremental um, sort of versions of this that you're seeing, I think are an attempt to respond to the concerns that we've heard from the administration. And so I'm, I would love to hear just more process wise about you know, how, if the ask is to take a comprehensive look at this and kind of start over, you know, what process wise do you think needs to be done differently from what we've already done here? Because we, we did spend several years, I think, and with, with, and the sentencing commission in particular, taking a comprehensive look at this. And this was a proposal that came forward with a lot of agreement from a lot of different parties. And so just process wise about this comprehensive work to um, define a rational system that's not incremental. Do you have thoughts that you wanna share about, you know, how, what that process should look like that's different from what we've done in the past? Sure. Um, well, not an expert at process equity. Um, being part of the sentencing commission, I can tell you it is a, it's a, it is a closed group. Um, it's not reflective of all aspects of, uh, of Vermont and all potential interests in, uh, in this kind of a, um, in this component of the justice system. Um, so I would open um, up the discussion to a, a much broader array uh, of folks for, for input, um, where I think the, uh, as I testified to the, the very first time, where I think the most important things uh, to discuss are, are the differences between um, sealing and expungement, the, um, the collateral impacts of, um, of deleting, you know, detailed records uh, that are in the government's possession, um, which I think have a, are fraught with a variety of, of downside uh, policy implications. Um, at the same time, the other side of that coin is a, a move, as I as I mentioned previously, to a, a system of sealing could actually enable uh, a wider array of things to be sealed potentially some of them on a more rapid timeline than are even contemplated here um, in the expungement rule. Uh, so, you know, between who's involved in the process and the scope of discussion 
Uh, I think both of those things could stand um, uh, significant broadening in order to come to a, what I think is, uh, I think there's an opportunity here for a more balanced public policy approach uh, than building on a system that is antiquated. Um, uh, the, I believe the expungement system is antiquated for a host of reasons that I have uh, previously art articulated. In the, in, you know, starting with in the 21st century, um, eliminating a government record of something is, is just problematic for a host of reasons. Um, and again, without going into all the ones I mentioned earlier, it's just, it's problematic. Um, I appreciate your answer. And I don't know if, I, um, I guess I had a follow-up question, but I, I wanna leave space for um, Attorney Johnson to, to answer too, if, if she chooses. Uh, I would agree with Commissioner Sherling. I think that um, a more balanced approach um, is always better than building on an antiquated system. Um, we are focused on transparency in state government, um, but we also understand the implications of the need for certain individuals to be free from their past records. And um, so we, I, I think that, I mean, I, I agree with Commissioner Sherling. It's always better, it's never good to build on a system that is either antiquated or broken already. Thank you. Um, so my, my follow-up question, just um, I think a um, number of the things that Commissioner Sherling, you highlighted as you know, such as the difference between expungement and sealing and really taking a close look at that. I think those are things the Sentencing Commission and the legislature has looked at pretty closely. Um, but I appreciate very much your comment around um, getting more people around the table and more input. And I'm wondering if you could just be more specific about who you think has been missing from the conversation. You talked about equity. So I'm assuming maybe you mean folks who have historically been, you know, left out of the conversation, marginalized, oppressed, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure who, who else you feel needs to be at the table. And I'd love to hear more about that. Well, um, missing from the table are those who um, are impacted by um, the ceiling of records, whether that's, uh, it's overly simplistic to say two sides of the same coin, those who have records that need to ha have a compelling need to have them expunged or sealed. And at the same time, those who uh, may be victims of crimes where expunging or sealing a record may um, have an impact on them uh, as well. So in, in its most simplistic form, um, those folks are missing from the conversation. Um, Again, not being an, a, a full expert on process equity, uh, there are um, really, a, a, and it's, it actually goes beyond that as I think about it, Vermonters in general have not been, um, I, I don't think are privy to uh, these kinds of detailed uh, conversations around what, what we're doing with the justice system on a day-to-day -day basis and the alterations we're making um, until they hear about it uh, after it impacts them. Um, and there are a few examples of folks who have had to come forward um, to various committees in the last couple of years to say, hey, you know, you didn't think about X or you didn't think about Y uh, when you did A or B. Um, so I think doing that, uh, whether it's for underserved, uh, uh, historically underserved populations or just in general, so Vermonters are aware of what the policy options are um, is something we value on certain topics. And then on other topics, um, it's tangential to our process. Yeah, thanks. Barbara. Thank you. So I know that, and good morning, um, I know that um, both of you are not 
huge fans of expungement and Commissioner Sherling, you've made a case for the importance of sealing. And one of the things that seems so difficult, I am definitely do not like doing these sort of piecemeal meal, um, efforts because you're right, like as we're doing them, you sort of feel like, is it worth it? Like we're making, like it doesn't make sense all the time. Compromise ends up really tearing apart sort of the underlying philosophy that would make us consistent. And while I wasn't at those groups that Representative Coburn talked about that have had discussions about it, it's so difficult, as you both know, I'm trying to think of an example of us taking an entire dysfunctional, um, or let's not say dysfunctional, an, an antiquated system and blow it up and start a new one. Like that's, if it were up to me, I would do that with a bunch of things, you know? I mean, school reform, uh, school financing, uh, our, I mean, there are so many things we could change that would make sense for this day and age. Um, and I know um, the governor and I have like similar thoughts about schools even, but it's so hard in this body to do that, that I think we need to look at how can we incrementally, unless we can all work to get that, that support that you both talk about, make these changes? How can we keep the underlying philosophy in place? I, again, this is not like the GMO bill where we are gonna be the first one and oh my gosh, look at all the states that have enacted um, clean slate legislation automatically. And by automatically, I don't mean for the court personnel, I mean, for the people who are affected. And I'm very appreciative, um, Commissioner, of you saying, get the people who are affected, because I know we could get employers um, here, um, which I think we didn't hear from that many employers. I was trying to think about that. We could get people who could tell you how difficult it's been getting a job. I have worked with a lot, a lot of folks in that regard. And I know we have worked with the victim folks quite a bit um, and was hoping when you meant that you didn't mean sort of like, let's put it to the public because um, it's a complicated issue. And we talked about that last time. So I'm wondering how we cannot, because, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, it feels like if somebody doesn't want a bill to pass, they'll say, let's make it, you know, let's do a full sweep, which there were times that I say that in my head, like I'm gonna weigh out like, is this incremental better than nothing or not? Like we did it with uh, election uh, law finance, uh, financing a few years ago. So I'm just wondering how um, you would feel comfortable having an underlying philosophy um, take some steps because this isn't, I don't feel like this bill is something willy nilly we picked up at the um, end of the session that um, didn't have a lot of vetting and thought that went into it by a lot of different people. And um, part of me is like, I, we can't go get the witch's broom right now. How can we make, how can we make a difference in the lives of some people that, um, really are not gonna jeopardize public safety and will make Vermont a better place and fill some of those job vacancies we can't fill. Yeah, it's a great uh, sort of array of questions I think that, you, that you've <laughs> posed and, and having come from uh, the Agency of Commerce, um, I can't overstate the, the need um, to uh, find new ways to activate workforce. Um, and this is an impediment for some folks, absolutely. Uh, you know, the approach, at, this is going to be slightly oversimplified, but the approach that I would take uh, is engage a broader array of stakeholders beyond just the folks that are embedded in the justice system and are, are you know, on the Sentencing Commission, a bunch of really smart folks. 
Um, but our field of view, unless you consciously take a step back, the field of view is relatively narrow. Um, so the, the process that I would envision to try to get to the ideal state here would be to engage a larger array of stakeholders, set out what are our public policy goals. So for example, we want people to be able to get low level convictions in the rear view mirror quickly. We want sort of mid-level offenses uh, to hang around a little bit longer, but eventually be able to get those in the rear view mirror. For some high level offenses, the public policy is, hey, you're not gonna be able to get those completely in the rear view mirror, but they're, if there's a way to make them a little smaller, objects in mirror are more distant than they appear, um, you know, that's great. Um, I think a public policy goal should be, and, and this is just my thought, the one that I've reiterated a number of times, we should never eradicate a record of government action. Uh, being just taking a report about, especially today in the 21st century, about something a law enforcement agency and then a prosecutor's office and then the judiciary did and getting rid of it seems counterintuitive. So we wanna be able to maintain records of government action. Um, take those core tenets and superimpose on it systems that allow those things to happen. And maybe that, you know, the, the, you mentioned clean slate legislation. Uh, I would be in favor, and I, I can't uh, speak for anyone else in the executive branch, but I would be in favor of automatic sealing for certain kinds of offenses. You reach X date, it's, you don't have a process. If you have no other offenses, you haven't been charged with any other crimes, it automatically seals. Um, at the same time, at the other end of the system, regardless of what's been sealed, there is a, a logical rubric that's been set forth for the judiciary to unseal a record under certain circumstances. I, and I don't know exactly what they are, but things like uh, a new offense where the fact pattern um, is relevant to uh, the prosecution or sentencing of a person in the future. Um, the defendant in that case needs it to be unsealed so they can get a copy to, for some reason, maybe it's for an employer, maybe it's to refute a, uh, a social media claim about a prior news article claiming they did something more substantial than was actually in the affidavit. Um, so uh, without going into every potential nuance, th those are some examples of the, uh, the type of process and the um, what an outline of the public policy goals could look like, and then what, um, you know, one person's version, in this case, just my version of what uh, execution of those public policy goals could look like if we took a comprehensive view. And Chair Bird, and I'm just wondering if I could comment as well. Um, so I think, first of all, thank you, Representative um, Rachelson. Um, I, I would just want to correct, I think, what a perception that you um, stated in the beginning, which was we aren't big fans of expungement. And I think that on its face, it, depend, it depends what you mean by expungement, because obviously there's also expungement and sealing that we've been talking about. But um, so I think that that, that that is not correct. I think we're being asked, do you like apple pie or cherry pie? We're not being asked, do you like pie? Um, and Mike is answering the question, sure, this is the pie I like. Um, so, so to be painted into that corner of, well, they obviously don't like pie is, is not accurate. Um, I think I'd like to say that a good example of how we have worked with the legislature and the judiciary, again, is the justice reinvestment exercise. Um, and how important that has been. Um, so it originally it pointed out that our furlough system was tremendously broken and we had added on to it and it made it so complex over the years that it had undermined its own effectiveness um, and wasn't helping anybody. This year, we took additional steps to address probation. So, so those steps are very important and they don't mean we don't like pie. It means that there is a way to do this right. And I think that, again, if you focus on principles, um, I think also like Commissioner Sherling is suggesting, um, there are certain things we know. And again, that's length of time needed to reduce risk. And on clean slate laws, I looked at Pennsylvania's law and Pennsylvania wipes 
certain misdemeanors, and um, I think that includes certain violent crimes, clean after 10 years of no reoffense. Um, that seems like a very simple approach. Again, it will boil down to what the crimes are, but after 10 years with no reoffense, that's consistent, I think, with what we're trying to do. Um, so again, length of time needed to reduce risk, no intervening crimes, and um, court involvement in discretion, because what we mean by discretion is in the interests of justice, which is what that law says throughout when the court is given some discretion. Um, so I do think that there are ways we can work together and we can start with the current system. It's just not adding more onto broken, but, but taking a hard look at the system itself. Um, the results that came out of the, of the um, Sentencing Commission was really a negotiation, which resulted in a more fragmented and again, I think less effective system because you built in ways to get around the periods of waiting and granting discretion to some who are not the courts and not the legislature in order to make the policies regarding length of time. Um, I think that's a mistake. Um, but I think that we have a system and it's, it's something that can be fixed. Thank you, I realize I'm jumping in and I believe Representative Burdett needs to, um, needs to leave for, um, for another commitment. Um, I'm not seeing any hands, but um, Tom, is there anybody I'm missing or? Uh, no, no, uh, Barbara was the last hand that was up and I don't know if anybody else has any questions for uh, Jay or Mike or not, um, if not, be moving on to the next witness. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, thank, thank you. you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry that I wasn't able to be here the whole time, but with YouTube, I can watch it. Um, okay. Thank you. So we're, um, we're going to continue on S7 just for a few more minutes. Um, and then we'll get to the budget. I do see, um, Let's see, we've got legal aid and defender general's office. I think it's still here. Why don't we um, start with um, with legal aid, please? And then um, and then we'll turn to the budget after our break um, and hear from Office of Child Support. So Office of Child Support, support you has some has some time. Thank you. Good morning. Um, can't. Oops. Can I? I'm on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. Maureen O'Reilly from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify on S7. Um, as I said a couple of weeks ago when I testified, I appreciate the work that you've done on this bill um, and your willingness to engage with the concerns um, coming out of the administration over the last couple of weeks. Um, while I appreciate that, I have significant concerns that moving forward with the current draft of the bill um, is going to set us back a number of years uh, and sort of be difficult to uh, come away from and really create the comprehensive change that we need um, with expungement in the state. So our position um, at Legal Aid is that this committee should pass just a few sections of the bill, one, two, five, six, seven, and eight, but eight as passed out of the Senate. Um, as you can likely all anticipate, um, it is painful for legal aid to recommend jettisoning any part of the bill um, that we have worked so hard for so many years with a diverse array of stakeholders around, um, but we can't in good conscience support a bill that would you know, appear to move the needle forward, but actually erect significant access to justice barriers. Um, I do not think we've had enough time to really consider all of the nuances uh, and contingencies um, and worry uh, similar to Commissioner Sherling, but um, a bit different worry that there will be some serious unintended consequences. Um, and I think that this last minute conversation has really caused us to lose track of the bigger picture um, and the context of what this work has been about. Um, and so I just wanna spend a minute to talk a little bit about the bigger picture. 
Um, and, and this bigger picture is that one in four Americans has a criminal record, not because one in four Americans is a dangerous person or a threat to public safety, but because the American criminal legal system has expanded its purview to such a drastic extent in such an unprecedented way across the globe and has continued to create new crimes and expand its jurisdiction into the lives of low-income people and people of color. Um, the stakeholder group that we worked with in the Sentencing Commission's uh, expungement subcommittee is an incredibly diverse group um, made up of the judiciary and the attorney general's office, the sheriffs and state's attorneys, legal aid, defender general, victims folks, Vermont Crime Information Center, even uh, the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, we've grappled with that reality, that this is what the criminal legal system in the United States has been over the last several decades. And there is a very real and very recent historical wrong that needs to be righted. And there are too many people who have been brought into the system and who have been saddled with criminal records. So the group decided on a compromise bill um, and we also decided what sort of level of specificity and nuance we needed to protect all interests, including access to justice interests. Um, so our, our biggest concern about what's really been eroded in this current version of the bill is that um, the state's attorney's ability to stipulate prior to the wait times um, is essentially no longer there. And um, this is significant because this has been a, a, an access to justice lever. Um, it's relieved pressure on the very busy courts and state's attorney's office and allowed them to process um, the cases that they don't think pose a significant threat to public safety. Um, state's attorneys and courts always have the ability to call for a hearing or state's attorneys can object if they have a concern. Um, but removing the ability for the state's attorneys to um, allow the, the smooth and, and flexible processing of these um, of record clearance is, I think, a mistake. Um, so I for for those reasons, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I, I think that removing the ability um, for the state's attorneys to stipulate um, and um, and altering the charge um, in section eight around the study committee um, should be reversed. Um, so we would just ask that sections three and four not get passed um, and that section eight um, as passed out of the Senate um, go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I, um, I want to go back to, um, in the beginning of your testimony, you said sections one, two, five, six, six, seven, and, and eight, 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 eight as passed out of the Senate. By, yeah. by passed by the Senate, which is a more comprehensive. Um, okay, thank you. Um, and do you still need to leave at 10 or can you? I can hang, I can hang around for a little bit if folks have questions. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Uh, Selena. Uh, thank you so much. And I, my question, I'm wondering, we heard um, a number of times in the earlier testimony this morning that the system of expungement is broken. And I'm wondering, and we also heard about the importance of making sure all voices that are at the table. And since you are an attorney who I think has worked with um, impacted folks in, in the form of people who are looking to get records expunged, probably as much or more than anyone else in the state. I'm wondering if you can tell us just from the perspective of your clients and your work um, and the, the changes we've made in recent years on expungement is, a, do, you, do you agree with that assessment that the system of expungement is broken? No, I don't agree with that assessment. Um, I think the system can always be made better and more efficient. Um, but I, 
I don't see um, anything or I haven't seen anything but a good faith effort by a very diverse group of folks to come together and help, especially our low income Vermonters, um, move on with their lives after a period of criminal legal involvement. Um, over the last couple of years, as we've been deliberating, um, I think to the extent that anything is uh, not working very well. I think it's that um, on the front end of prosecuting cases, there's a very mechanized uh, sort of smooth way of moving these people through the system. But on the back end, after they've had this involvement and um, retain this criminal record that impacts their employment and ability to reintegrate into society, there's no very smooth way to move people through the system, which is why I think we're coming back or the plan was to come back next year and figure out, is there a way to, as Representative Rachelson said, um, from the petitioner's perspective, automate that process and make it smooth and easy because the reality is legal aid is, is the only shop in town that's working with low income people to clear their records. And we don't even have a full-time staff attorney position to continue to do this work. So these folks are largely going to be pro se individuals or folks who are you know able to get into some clinic slot through the attorney general's office. Um, but we don't have public defenders doing expungement work. Legal aid has been able to do that work for a period of time, but my role has shifted and, and we simply don't have the funding to continue this. So to, to make this system more complicated, um, I guess I'm sort of getting off on a little bit of a tangent, but the only uh, real complaints we have about this is that it's not more automated from the petitioner's perspective. Otherwise, um, you know, we, we think this system, you know, is starting to give, um, give folks a real opportunity to, to access the relief um, and, and the sort of forgiveness that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, messy, any, messy, any other hands? So thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you were be able to, to be here this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so um, before our break, let's, um, let's hear from the Defender General's office uh, and then we'll take our break. Good morning, Marshall. Thank you. Good morning, thank you. Um, so I'll be very brief because our testimony is not that different from, um, not that different from the testimony that we provided last time and frankly, quite similar to Vermont Legal Aid's testimony. Um, I think last time we testified that uh, we did not see the changes to this bill as having been positive. Um, in fact, we saw them as having made the bill not a good bill. Um, we continue to think that that's the case. To the extent that there is still positive to come from this bill, I think it would be, as Legal Aid said, um, by passing those limited sections, um, I believe, hold on, I have to pull up my cheat sheet, but if... Um, one, two, five, six, seven, and as legal aid said, um, passing section eight, but section eight as it passed the uh, Senate, not section eight as it is in this bill. Um, and really the reasons for that are exactly what I testified to last time. So I'll skip over everything except for briefly addressing the differences between the section eight that was on the table last time um, and the one from this time. And that's just to say that um, really this makes a fundamental change in the direction that uh, expungement reform takes going forward. The, the Section 8, as it passed the Senate, and even Section 8 last time that we were taking testimony, uh, was directing a further look at the expansion of the scope of our expungement system. Section 8, as it is in this bill, actually doesn't contemplate that at all and instead contemplates for, uh, reductions in the scope of our expungement system. That's certainly something uh, that we don't support, would be, uh, you know, pursuing, to, you know, turning this conversation 
in that direction from the direction of looking at expansion. Because frankly, when you compare us to the states around us, when you look at Massachusetts, when you look at New Hampshire, we have a very, very limited system of expungement. In New Hampshire, in Massachusetts, they can expunge many, many more offenses. They can do so much quicker um, and they can do so much easier. And so for us to be talking about limiting expungement and seeking proposals to limit expungement is really moving us in the wrong direction. So that's why at this point we oppose um, you know, the new redraft of section eight we would support if it, it support it if it continued to reflect a um, goal of exploring ex the expansion of the scope of our expungement law. Um, but as it stands now, we can't support it. Thank you, thank you, Marshall. Any? Not seeing any hands. So, um, so Selena, actually, before. Selena, before you, um, I'm just, so I'm looking at the, um, as past Senate, so section one um, is regarding the listed crimes, and then. I should maybe clarify, um, I'm saying that we are, we're okay with the bill if it is sections one, two, five, six, and seven of the current draft, and section eight of the as past the Senate draft. Is that clear? Did I say that clearly? You you did. Um, I was trying to address the most current draft that was on the website this morning. Okay. okay. Um, and, yeah. and like I said, we're okay with sections one, two, five, six, seven, eight of that draft, or five, six, seven of that draft. Okay. And section eight of the has passed the Senate draft. Okay. Um which I think is different than what I heard from legal aid. I think legal aid was referring to the same, and it may not matter, but um, but anyway, I, I, I think I've got it. <laughs> um, I think legal aid was was talking about the ass pass in the Senate. Um, but in looking at that one, we're talking about the listed crimes, the surcharge, the effective sealing, sealing of records, Expungement of violation records. That's the um, language with DMV that Judge Grierson worked on. And then the um, Sentencing Commission um, report, it's my understanding. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Uh, Selena. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give you actually ask the same question I asked a previous witness, just give you an opportunity to talk. Um, to comment on this notion that the expungement system and the changes we've made in recent years are, are somehow a broken system. Sure. I mean, I don't see them as broken, but I do see them as having a lot of room for improvement. I mean, I think there's areas where I would certainly agree with the administration around the need for improvement of the system. And I think all you need to do is look next door, for example, at New Hampshire to see how, um, you know, a how much better a system can work when it really is, provides a broad remedy and provides uh, you know a broad scope um, and how much easier that works instead of doing you know little carve outs here, little carve outs there. You know in, in New Hampshire, almost everything is expungible. Their list of non-expungible crimes is shorter than our big 12 list, which you know was far afield of what we're talking about here. Um, so in New Hampshire, and, and just as the administration has suggested, in New Hampshire, it's a very much structured around uh, periods of time after uh, conviction. So it's, you know, in New Hampshire, it's to, to get to the serious felonies like sex assault or um, aggravated assault or serious violent felonies, that's a 10 year waiting period. It's a very long time that they have to wait. So while I, I would not characterize the system as broken, I certainly would accept the characterization that there's certainly a lot of room for improvement and a lot of mo great models that we can look at when we're looking at how to improve. Thank you very much. Any, uh, any other questions? Not seeing any, any hands. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our, our witnesses. And we will adjourn for a uh, break now until, let me say, 1030.